Sinkfield Cup round number three recap. This is 10 of the best players in the world. We're playing a game in 40 moves in 90 minutes and then a bonus 30 minutes, 30 second increment throughout. We had some exciting ones today. Let's jump right in. The first game we have world champion Megs Carlson with the white pieces against the youngster Hans Niemann who won in round number two. So these players are tied for first. This is the biggest game of the round. Okay, so we see this typical Indian game set up. E6, knight f6 by Hans. Knight c3, and now we get a Nimzo Indian pinning the knight. G3 by Magnus, and this sort of takes it into like Catalan looking territory, right? Normally in the Catalan, you have the bishop on g2, pawns on d4, and c4. The difference though is this knight on c3. It's not quite Catalan, it's still kind of more Nimzo Indian if you had to pick. Now this trade occurs, and here Hans grabs an extra pawn. So we're only following 18 games in the database, but there's a good chance this will be an exciting game, because by Hans grabbing that extra pawn early, it gives Magnus the advantage in terms of dynamics. So Magnus has this really strong bishop on g2 on the long diagonal, and he also has the bishop pair, two bishops for bishop and knight. Knight f3, c5. What Hans is trying to do here is he sees that his king is castled, Magnus's king is still on e1, and he knows he's up a pawn, but it's a double pawn, right? These pawns are doubled on the c-file, so he wants to quickly strike in the center and trade off one of the double pawns. Castle, and this c takes d4 was kind of a rare move. Um, we're only following one game here. When I click it, none of the games even show up. So this is sort of like the new move by Hans. C takes d4. And if you look at his clock, it doesn't feel like it's completely prepared unless he's just sort of checking his notes as he goes um, because he's down to an hour and 18 and Magnus is still definitely in prep with an hour and 32. Queen takes d4, knight c6. Now this is an interesting choice. Magnus does not have to take the pawn, but really that's the strongest line. But you could argue here that black has an advantage because there's this weak pawn on c3. E5 played by Hans, bishop g5, h6. Magnus does not really want to give up that bishop pair, so he plays rook to d1, attacking the queen. Bishop to e6, strongest move on the board, counterattacking Magnus's queen. And here Magnus plays rook takes d8, top move, bishop takes queen, rook takes rook, rook takes back, bishop takes f6, so giving up the bishop pair to damage black's pawns, g takes f, now let's take count here. The pawns are exactly equal, same number for each side, six versus six, bishop and knight each, and a rook each. So we're in equal territory, and I think here Magnus is seeing if he can grind down Hans in an endgame. We saw Ali Reza lose in an endgame to Jan Napomniachi, and I think that's something where when younger players haven't been at the super GM level for long enough, they're not used to some of these endgame grinds, and some of the more experienced players can try to take advantage of that, try to take them down in the end game. Magnus plays king f1 to defend this pawn, but it's actually not the best move. Knight to h4, allowing the pawn to be captured, followed by knight to f5. That's the strongest way to play, and that's a really good outpost for the knight, threatening to take on h6. And king h7, it looks like it's defending, but I would be a little bit worried about a move like bishop to e4, Lining up the bishop with the king feels like white's getting a lot of play here. Instead, Magnus plays defensive with king to f1, and this gives black a bit of an advantage because the d8, rook to d8 move, controls the d-file. So Hans is controlling the only open file on the board. That's really important. Magnus plays king e1, probably trying to get rook to d1 in next, contest the file. There it is. And now rook to c8, so Hans allows Magnus into his position, but he wants to target the weakness on c3 by putting his rook on c8. Bishop retreats back, so now we see this attack on the pawn. And here Magnus gives it up, pawn to c4, after takes, 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 rook d8 check, king d g7. This is now one pawn up for Hans with a knight against bishop imbalance. So Magnus does have some compensation for the pawn, but it's actually less than a full pawn worth. So you have to ask yourself from the white side, was this worth it? Does Magnus feel that there are any winning chances for him? Because if there's not, 
this was really not a good decision. It, it gave Hans an advantage having the extra pawn. Okay, that's the best square for the bishop. It points at f7. It's something to keep in mind. When you get these type of endgames with a rook and bishop for one side, oftentimes you want to attack either the f7 pawn or the f2 pawn if you were playing black because you can have both rook and bishop put a lot of pressure on that f7 square and it can be difficult for black to defend. So that's what Magnus is doing here, putting the bishop on d5 and that's why Hans plays rook to c7, not allowing rook to d7. Rook a8, playing active. Rook b8, also playing active. Attacked twice, defended twice. And now here, um, I was watching one of those streams, and e4 was recommended as an idea if white can get it in safely, because you want to just protect this bishop on d5, make sure that he can park there long term. Rook to e8 played, though, and e4 by Hans, very strong move. Um, all of a sudden, this bishop cannot be defended by a pawn anymore, and it's kind of floating out here in space. g4, so Magnus is looking for dynamic play, and Hans finds a strong move, rook to c5, attacking the bishop, and after it moves, brings the knight to c4, um, attacking this pawn on a3. Now, the top engine move here is bishop takes c4, but essentially what happens after this is Magnus has to accept the fact that he is not going to be playing for a win here. Um, this is probably either a draw or a win for black. Black can play like b5, rook a4, try to pick up this pawn on a3. Magnus is not having any fun in this position. So instead he plays a4, keeping the bishop on the board. Knight to d6. And look at the knight. It guards all of these pawns at once. Now we see a mistake by Magnus, rook to e7. The only good move is rook to d8. And if you look at the clocks, he only had 13 minutes left, 10 more moves to make time control, so not a lot of time for Magnus to find rook to d8. And the problem with uh, rook to d7, e7, excuse me, is rook to c2 can be played. And Hans does not find this move, but he finds the next best move, which is still taking advantage of the mistake by Magnus. He plays f takes g, rook to d7, and e3, top move again by Hans. f takes e, knight e4. So look at this knight. It guards d2, f2, and Magnus has to watch out for checkmate threats. Rook to c1 could be a checkmate if that rook cannot block on the d file. King f1, rook c1's check still played, and then rook to c2, targeting this pawn and bishop. Hans is still up a pawn. Keep that in mind. Plus one for Hans on the material count. Bishop takes f7. Rook takes e2 check. Rook e1 check. He's repeating a couple times, getting a little bit of time on the clock. And now king f6. One thing to keep in mind, when you reach the endgame, it's really important to play actively. Hans is showing great endgame technique in this game. He's marching his king up the board. That's how you can start to apply extra pressure to the white king. Bishop d5. Hans pins it. Good move. Six. And now we see the king start to inch up the board. Oh, this was a cool tactic. Sorry, I kind of glossed over this. Bishop check. The rook is hanging. But if rook takes rook, there's always knight to f3 check, forking the king and rook back. So Hans saw that, of course wins the rook back, and now we get this imbalance of just a knight against a bishop. There's one extra pawn for Hans, and it's a potential pass pawn once it gets up to b5. So the way that you try to prevent that pawn from being a pass pawn is what Magnus does, pawn to a5. This b pawn cannot safely push due to en passant. King to e5 though by Hans, centralized king, this matters. Knight f1 check. If king takes g4, there's knight takes h2 check. Knight takes h2 still played. Um, I'm not sure what the strategy was by Magnus here. This actually seems like the best move. And after takes, like maybe king g3 or king h4, king h5, one of those moves. But instead, he for some reason plays king to f2. And after knight takes, he plays pawn to e4. Just kind of throwing away all the pawns. I don't understand this. Oh, I think, okay. Here's what he wants to do. He wants to attack the b pawn with the bishop. So he's playing e4 thinking, 
that will defend d5. So I can put the bishop here, and then I can attack b7, and if I win that, I win a6. And this knight is too far away to help defend the pawns. The king is also too far away to defend that pawn. And after king takes, this was his idea. The bishop will come attack the pawns this way, and that black king cannot get back in time. Look what Hans does. He calculates it out, calmly plays king over to f4, and says, you can have that pawn. I'm going with my own pass pawns. He just plays knight to f3. Knight e5. Magnus gets what he wants, wins both of those pawns. And now knight to c6. Hans picks that pawn back up for free, and he has two versus none over here on the king side. And at this point, Magnus puts his bishop here, which guards all of the squares for the knight. The knight cannot move. But Hans has these pawns free to move up the board. And at this point, after king to e5, the bishop has to move, which frees the knight. Magnus resigns. So Hans, two wins in a row, and he beats the world champion and the world number one, Magnus Carlsen, with the black pieces. What an incredible game by Hans Niemann. This puts him in the lead with two out of three. All right, let's jump into the next game. Ali Reza Faruja, another youngster, is the white pieces against Laban Aronian. And here we see an Italian game with an early h3. I like watching some of these Italian game subtleties. What are the players going to show us that's new? h3, pretty rare move. We're only seeing about 20 games in the database, whereas prior to that move, we had 20,000 games. Castle, knight to c3, knight to a5 by Aronian. Let's see who's played this. Oh, game from today. Nice spoiler. Uh, but no other famous games, really. So now let's switch over to analysis. On to a3, played by Ferruja. I wonder if this was cooked up or not. So at this point, they each had over 90 minutes. And Ferruja spends 14 minutes on this one move, a3. Threatening to play b4, and it's really encouraging Levan to take, which he does. So Levan gets the bishop pair. Aronian has weak pawns, uh, doubled pawns, I should say, on the c-file. Not necessarily weak. You have to ask yourself, what does white have in return for those imbalances? Extra space with the c-pawn and e-pawn both guarding d5, and a potential kingside attack. We see this bishop ready to come out. Maybe the queen goes up. Queenside castle. So we see d6 by Levan. Winning the knight, bishop g5, pawn targets the weak pawn, and now queen to d3. I like this tile position. It looks like there's going to be flank attacks on both sides if Ferruja gets castle queenside. h6, bishop h4. And now we see g5 played by Levan. This was blitzed out. This is very common in these Joko piano type structures to play h6, g5. But in this case, it's a mistake and Ferruja capitalizes on it. So he had an hour and eight minutes. He spends four minutes to check his work, but he knows that this is a mistake, and he plays knight takes g5. A lot of times we teach new players not to go for this trade because white got two pawns um, for the piece. Technically, the piece is stronger than two pawns. But in this case, there is enough play that black is in a little bit of trouble here. So this knight is pinned long term, and it's almost impossible to free it. King g7, pawn to f4, blowing open the position. If a rook lands on f1, that attacks the pinned knight. E takes f, knight e2. So right now, Aronian is up two points in terms of material, but this knight is moving to e2, which opens up the threat of queen to c3. I think that's one idea. But the knight could also take here and head to h5 check. So, real aggressive play by Ali Reza, and he has the advantage. On to c6, on to b4, taking that bishop. After bishop to e3, he plays rook to e1. We have a really wild position. The key thing is this king is up on g7, and Aronian plays king to g6, using the king to try to kick away that bishop. On to h4 by Ferruja. It looks like bishop to h4 was slightly stronger, but still advantage white. Bishop takes c4. Now things are just getting crazy. 
after queen takes c4, pawn to d5. So Ronian gave back the piece. Um, if he doesn't give back the piece, like let's just say he makes a waiting move, queen to e7, there's a really strong reply. Rook takes f4, and if bishop takes, there's e5 check, or knight takes f4. This is all falling apart for black. Now there's knight to h5 check, or even pawn to e5 is very strong. Followed by this. That's actually a checkmate. So really falling apart for a Ronin in that line. He has to give this back. Bishop takes c4. And look at the clock for a Ronin at this point. Under 21 minutes, 47 minutes for Ferruja. Queen takes c4 back. d5, queen to b3. This is something we've seen for Feru from Ferruja in the past year to, to a year and a half. He can have real aggressive games where he can outplay people and crush them right out of the opening. So far, he's doing that to Levon Aronian, which is really impressive. Rook e8, bishop takes f4, knight takes f4 check, the king is still exposed, and now finally Ferruja castles, we're 23 moves deep, queenside castle, and this king is fairly safe. Knight takes e4, bringing us back to equal material. Knight to e2, a bit of a mistake here. The strongest move is knight takes d5, and I'm surprised Ferruja didn't find this, he's playing so tactically sharp. After c takes d5, there's now rook takes d5, and this exposed king is going to cause some problems for black. Instead, he brings the knight back to e2, and then queen to d3 check, queen to d4 check, and honestly, Aronian is not making the most precise defensive moves, but that's because his clock is low, and it's a little bit easier to attack than defend when the clocks are low, so Farouge is using that to his advantage. Knight to g3. Targeting these light squares, queen to d3, check. And now we see the knight head to the powerful square f5. Essentially, black has to trade knights here, otherwise that knight is going to help with queen to uh, g3, queen to g7, checkmate ideas. So takes, takes, king is wide open. All it takes is one of these rooks landing on the g-file, or the queen landing on the g-file with a rook heading to the h-file. A bunch of checkmates in the air. Queen rook combo. Queen e3 check. Queen b1. Queen e6. Levon using the queen to help defend. And if this were a club level game, there's a chance here that black is holding this, getting the queens traded off. The Ferruja is really calm, puts the queen back on f2. Ronian goes for counterplay, trying to open up the rook. Now rook to d3, lifting the rook ready to come over to g3 with check, which he gets. King f8, and now rook to f3, rippling on the f-file, threatening the immediate rook takes f7. Rook to e7 is an interesting move, but the problem is rook to f6, hitting the queen and opening up the h6 square for white's queen. So king g8 was played, and look at this finishing blow. Rook takes f7. If you want to pause the video, you can try to calculate what happens here. After rook takes a3, rook to f8. Queen to f7 check, resignation. The problem is, after queen takes, rook takes, king g6, there's now pawn to h5 check. The king has to leave the attack on the f7 rook, and when it does, rook takes e8 is played. Game over. Feruja's up a rook. So Feruja, Feruja notches a win here. Great game against the Aronian. Next up, we have two Americans, Wesley Sill with the white pieces against Fabiano Caruana. See a double king pawn, which leads to a Petrov's defense. And this is all mainline stuff. Until bishop to d3, this move is pretty rare. Look, we have thousands of games here. Bishop to d3 drops us down to about 200 games. Kingside castle, bishop e7 on h3. There's no bishop to g4. And black is just a little bit behind in development, but kind of a standard Petrov position. It's very close to equal. Castle, c3, d5, bishop c2. This is sort of transposing to a standard Petrov once d4 is played. There it is. h6, rook e1. At this point, we're following six games. They're kind of on their own pretty soon, hour and a half each. Rook e8, rook takes, queen takes, bishop e3. 
White does still have both bishops pointing here. Black has both bishops pointing here. So there's chances for kingside attacks for both players. Knight c6, knight d2. Now both players are maneuvering the knights. They want to get the knights over here on the king side. Five, knight comes back. So this kind of reminds me of the Aronian game just slightly. Wesley so encourages Fabiano to play g5. Once g5 is played, it opens up this king position a little bit, and those pawns can never move backwards. You always want to be careful moving pawns in front of your king. And here we see a super GM doing it in Fabiano. He might regret that decision. Knight f5, knight f1, guarding the bishop. d7, d3. I think the idea here is the queen might come to c2 or to b3. So just that bishop's been moving all around, but it's kind of opening up the play for the queen. c6, queen b3. Poking at this pawn. Interesting though, if queen takes b7 occurs, there's actually a repetition where the rook can just go back and forth if the queen takes on a7. So it's not really a threat. Um, and knight e4 was played. Rook e1. And now we get the first imbalance with the minor pieces. We had a bishop pair for black, knight and bishop for white. Bishop e6, queen takes b7. So now things are getting a little bit dicey. Wesley is able to win the first pawn. He's up one on material. And after rook to b8, he sticks the queen on a6. So it's up to Fabiano now to decide, do I go for that pawn immediately? Rook takes b2. Or do I try to play for some sort of activity? And he goes aggressive. We've seen Fabi do this in so many games now. He plays really aggressively lately and looks for tactics. But he's playing against a monster in terms of strategic play in Wesley. So Wesley is an extremely solid player. He's now up a pawn. And the computer's saying 1.9. Rookie 2. Queen to d7, guarding this pawn. Queen comes back. And now Wesley's saying, all right, I just grabbed that pawn on b7 for free. I'm bringing all the pieces back, securing that advantage. It's up to you, Fabiano. Prove what you have with, with this kingside attack. So he's got to go all in here. b3, g4 was played. Takes, takes. And now... Strong calculation by Wesley. So he plays bishop takes e4, and after f takes, knight to e5. We have two bishops for two knights, but that e6 bishop is the same color as all of these pawns. That's a terrible bishop. And if this bishop trades off for a knight, which it does, now we have a strong knight against bad bishop imbalance. This is a huge advantage for Wesley So, and he knows it. Queen to c7, trying to attack that weak pawn. Queen to a4, though. Counterplay, attacking both pawns. We still have good knight against bad bishop. Rook to d2, double attack. Now knight to g2. This knight has other strong squares. Could go to f4, could go to h4. Okay, maneuvering the queen a little bit. Now we see this tactical shot, e6, after bishop takes... Um, c takes d. So if you play c takes d right away, it's slightly different because this bishop is defended. I think he wants the bishop to be a loose piece here, kind of like opening up that line for the queen, because now if c takes d is played, queen to g5 check immediately. So it's more about opening the line of the queen than the loose bishop. Right here, that pawn was blocking the queen. So this is increasing his attacking chances. Queen to b6, queen back to e2. Eyeing this pawn, eyeing this pawn. Trade, and now queen takes e4. In this position, Wesley's up one pawn still and has an, an extremely safe king. The king can hide on h2, he can hide on g1, and the knight is a lot stronger than the bishop because the bishop is just attacking this pawn and it's kind of floating out in space, whereas that knight is going to help attack the black king long term. So Fabi does grab this pawn back. Queen takes g4 check, queen f3 check, queen a3 check, queen a4 check. Look at the clocks, 20 minutes each, um, and they're now just playing on the 30 second increment. There's no more bonus time, because we're on move 44. And this is a, a position that Wesley can just play for a long time until Fabi makes a mistake. Now he starts pushing on the king side. 
slowly inching these pawns up the board where he has the extra pawns. Pawn f4. Looks scary, but there's nothing really that Fabiano can do here to cause damage. Here, Fabi makes a mistake. Look at the clocks. Five minutes for Fabi, four minutes for Wesley. He plays pawn to d3, trying to get this pawn down to promote. Queen takes a5 is the strongest move. Queen to d6 played, also very strong. And the problem is after bishop f3, this king is completely naked. Queen and knight in the area. Repeat a couple times, and now we see knight h6 threatening checkmate. And Fabi makes another mistake here with bishop to g2 check. Um, this allows king to g3, and then the king sneaks out to h4 and g5. Checks are running out. There's still the, the mate threats for Wesley, and that bishop is not helping out much. This pawn hasn't been able to push any further. A couple more repetition moves, and now knight to d6 check. Queen e7 check. Horse checkmate in seven moves with best play. King g8. King h6. Now it's a mate in five. Checkmate threatened on the board. Um, if this is played, for example, there's queen to e8 checkmate. No way out for black. Game over. Wesley So with the win joins the leaders on a plus one score. All right. Lanier Dominguez Perez against Jan Napomniachi. I'm going to just show you guys the critical point in the game. So this one ended up a draw, very high level play. Let's just jump to this point. Um, Bishop takes d2 was played in the game. So this came out of a Sicilian. And at this point, rook takes d2 back was played by Dominguez Perez. So let's look at what he could have done. Bishop takes d6 with the rook attacking the queen. After queen takes d6, there's queen takes b7 check. Double attack on this rook. The best move is queen e7. And after takes, takes, creative rooks, rook takes d2. Look at the resulting position. Look at all the pawns for white. Um, black can come rook c5 and win this one pawn back. But in the meantime, this king is going to advance. White has an extra pass pawn, and black has doubled isolated pawns. This is plus two territory. Very close to winning, if not winning, for white. Um, I think at the super GM level, he would win this game. Instead, rook takes d2, and then if you look at the chart after this, there was really no big advantage for Dominguez Perez. So ended up with a draw, but worth noting, Dominguez Perez did have some winning chances in that game. This last game, it was a very boring game. Uh, Mamadarov was white, MVL was black, and look at the chart. Completely equal. This started out in kind of like a queen's gambit accepted, and you just get this symmetry. The largest advantage was right around here. Bishop pair gets traded off. That bishop gets traded off. Dead drawn, rook and pawn endgame. All right, so how do the standings look after today's round? Hans Niemann, clear first place, two and a half points. He knocks Magnus down to an equal score, one and a half. And Wesley So is in second with his one win over Fabiano. So only two plus scores. Wesley and Hans, two Americans, but Hans with a plus two score. Awesome to see. Great job, Hans. Uh, I'm really looking forward to see what he does in the coming rounds. And the three players at the bottom, these were all like solid world number two players for a long time. Most recently, Fabiano. All of these players have been rated like over 28, 20, I want to say at one point. Um, Aronian's been 28, 30. Fabi's been like 28, 50. Really strong players at the bottom right now, though. So let's see if they can fight back. There's still a lot of rounds left. We have nine rounds total. So definitely time to come back. All right. So that's the end of the round three recap. Thank you guys for watching. I will see you for tomorrow's recap.